Good morning. Welcome, everyone. My name is Connor Rimke. Uh, if you're new to West London Alliance, uh, a warm welcome to you. Uh, if you want to get further connected with our church, there's a, a connection card in the seat in front of you with a couple of QR codes that you can scan with more information on our various ministries. In addition, you can sign up for our weekly email, which has all the happenings of our church, uh, whether that's the latest events or what's going on with the church. As we launch into the fall, in between the first and second service and after the second service in the south foyer, we'll be having a ministry fair uh, we'll be, where we'll be going through the seniors, men's, women's, youth, children's ministries, as well as life groups and community impact team where you can ask representatives if you have any questions or would like to get involved. Uh, youth ministries, junior high, and se junior high and senior high ministries are resuming this week with their annual visit to Tin Cup Mini Golf. Junior high students will be meeting on Tuesday evening at the church and high school students on Wednesday evening. Young adults, after the second service, young adults will be enjoying uh, a kickoff barbecue at 1230. Uh, if you're a college student or a regular attendee, please, please feel free to attend then uh, for a time of fellowship and lunch. Ladies between the ages of 19 and 99, this announcement is for you. Whether you're at West London for a long time or you're new, you'll find a great time at the Ladies Connection. We'll, they'll be going over snacks, Bible study, testimonies, prayer, and worship. Join us on Monday the 11th at 7 p.m. or Wednesday the 13th at 9.30 a.m. In addition, you can find out more information at the Women's Ministry page on our church website, wachurch.org. Tonight at 6 p.m., we'll be having our fall WLA members meeting. There will be teaching by Pastor Jude and a time of worship. Tonight's focus will be on WLA's vision for missions for the upcoming years. Next week, September 17th at 12.30 p.m. after the second service, we are offering a free lunch to anyone who is a newcomer to WLA. Besides sharing a delicious meal and uh, a good fellowship, you'll also have the opportunity to meet with some of the pastors and staff at our church. You can sign up by the QR code on the screen or by visiting our website. It'd be great to see you all there. Uh, continuing with our connection pathway, we have WLA 101. This is a session led by Jude, uh, where he outlined some of the distinctives of WLA. Uh, this will be held on S Sunday, September 24th, and is open to anyone. You'll be able to find out some history of WLA while also discovering some theological distinctives of WLA and be able to ask any questions to Pastor Jude. Please sign up for that in advance. Men of WLA, this announcement is for you. Our annual men's retreat is coming up September 29th to October 1st at Forest Cliff Bible Camp. This is always a great weekend of biblical teaching, great food, and fellowship. Make sure you sign up for that as well. Lastly, we praise God, along with Mark and Ashley Hartnett, on the birth of their daughter, Malaya Brielle, born on September 1st, weighing 8 pounds, 3 ounces. That's all for announcements. We've come here to worship God, so let's do just that. today to worship the Lord in our singing, in praying, in hearing the word taught, in receiving the word with joy, in our repentance, and in our receiving of forgiveness. We are meant to worship the Lord this morning with our whole being, and we have good reason to worship the Lord today. Regardless of the life circumstances that brought you here this morning, hear these words from Isaiah 61 that have encouraged me and strengthened me this week as I prepared for our time together. Isaiah 61, verses 10 to 11. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with robes of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. Whatever else is true about our lives today, if we are in Christ, we are 
clothed in garments of salvation. We are covered in robes of righteousness. Can you even believe it? So how could we not let praise sprout up from within us this morning? So whether with shouts of joy or tears of hope or sighs of waiting, let's stand as we are able and praise the Lord today with all of it. Please stand and sing. Thank you. 
Jesus, we rejoice in you and in your great salvation. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which we may be saved. You alone are the mediator between God and man. You alone are the way, the truth, and the life. We have a great dilemma in our sin and despair, and you are the only great and sufficient solution. All of our hope is in you and in your work on the cross. And so we thank you, Lord, and we stand on the good work you've done and the love you have poured out for us. Amen. one gospel on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my father's plan. The Son has rescued me. Oh Lord, a gospel, a word of peace. My highest joy and my deepest need. Now and forever he is my of Jesus Christ. There is one gospel to which I cling, all else I count as loss. For there where justice and mercy meet, he saved me on the cross.
I'll ask the kids to come up and join me on the steps for catechism. All right, kids. Kids, how many of you started school this week? Put up your hands. Okay, a lot of you. How many of you have ever got perfect on a test? (laughs) Yeah, there's some of you, right? It happens sometimes. How many of you think that you will get perfect on every test you ever write in your entire school career? That's confidence. I like the confidence. Listen, the question today is about perfection. Listen to question 13. We've been talking about the Ten Commandments. We've been talking about God's law. We've been talking about what God expects from people. Listen to this question. Can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? Is there any human being who can Follow all of God's commands perfectly without sinning. Listen to the answer. Since the fall, no human has been able to keep the law of God perfectly. Even though you might get perfect on a test, even though you might get perfect on every test throughout your school career, though I doubt it, (laughs) there is not a human being alive who can keep God's law perfectly. And that's what our question and answer teaches us. Now, there's a whole lot more to that story. It sounds pretty ominous, but there's good news that goes along with it, but we're not going to get to that today. I want you to think about that, that there is not a human being, none of us up here, none of you kids can keep God's law perfectly. Congregation, let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, we lift up these children to you. We thank you for them. We thank you, Father God, for their, uh, those who have started school and, uh, and pray that uh, you would bless them in that. Father God, help them to understand that no human being, none of us, can keep your law perfectly. I pray they would come to that realization. And Father God, through that realization, also understand that we need perfection and that someone has been perfect for us. I pray, Father God, that you would help them come to understand that perfection is found in Jesus Christ and that they would look to him for their salvation. Father God, I pray that you by your spirit would help them now as they go to their class, that they would learn of you, that your spirit would bless their teachers and bless their leaders, uh, that they would wisely and lovingly communicate your truth to them. And we ask you to watch over them today and the rest of this week. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, you're dismissed. Have a wonderful time in your Sunday school class.
As the kids make their way out of the sanctuary, I'll invite one of our elders, Brian Warad, to come and lead us to the Lord in prayer. Good morning, everyone. Um, for us as elders, uh, we've, as we've uh, been asked to pray in the morning services, a constant conversation we've had with each other is, should we prepare our prayers in advance, or uh, should we allow the Spirit to move uh, in the moment as we uh, pray in front of you? Um, I don't think there's any denying that the Spirit can move in uh, either of those two ways, either as we're at home preparing in advance to pray, or as we're standing in front of you praying now. But it became clear to us, or me anyway, and I'm sure all of us, together that um, the power in prayer is not in what the Spirit moves us to say from here, but it's the power that the Spirit uh, displays in each of your hearts as you go to prayer with us. And so I just would like to remind you that uh, it's not the prayer that uh, opens God's blessings to us. It's uh, the prayers of us that open our hearts to God's blessing. And so as we go to prayer now, uh, I remember uh, Steve Gaunt once saying, it's not about uh, what we do up here, that this is our praying together as a church family. I would just ask that, and I'm gonna ask you, to open up your heart in those places that you haven't traditionally opened up to God and uh, go there and allow the Spirit to go into those areas and allow the Spirit to speak to God on your behalf with undiscernible words that God and the Spirit understand as to how to minister into those areas. So I'll pray for certain prayer requests that we have, then I'll ask you uh, personally to do that prayer, praying uh, before God in your own hearts. Let's pray. Dear God, we, uh, we come to you this morning as we always should with prayers of thanksgiving. And Lord, to that end, uh, we'd like to give thankfulness for a life well lived for Bob Leghorn. Lord, we thank you that he is now in your presence, uh, having lived a life committed to you. And Lord, for a life based on uh, receiving the uh, gift of salvation. But Lord, we would like to lift up Kathy to you and the family as they mourn the loss of Bob and as they learn how to live uh, without him present with them. Lord, we pray that you would fill that void in every respect uh, to the Leghorn family. Lord, we'd also like to lift up Gerardo Prada, Lord, in the understanding that he um, uh, has learned that uh, his prostate cancer is limited to his prostate. But Lord, we would pray for his treatment to begin soon, that he would tolerate it well, and Lord, that uh, the healing would begin as you would see fit, and we would lift him up uh, into your healing hands. We'd also like to lift up Knollwood Church and Pastor Clausen, who has asked that uh, the leadership and the elders there would have wisdom in shepherding and that their witness would be faithful and effective. Lord, we also like to lift up Nikki and uh, Mike Howell to you, for Todd, Oliver, and Pascal, for transitioning them in their ministry back in Senegal on September 14th. Lord, we just pray that you would guide and direct their hearts as they um, move from the relationships and the time invested in people here, and Lord, be able to transition back and invest themselves well in uh, resuming and beginning ministries, Lord, back uh, in Senegal. And we lift them up and pray, Lord, that you'd be very present with them as they uh, go through that transition process and for their kids as well. Lord, you promised to each of us that you stand at the door of our hearts and knock. And if we invite you in, you promise to come in and dine with us. Lord, we recognize that this time of prayer this morning is our opportunity for you to invite, for us to invite you into our hearts, especially into those areas we have kept from you. Dear Lord, we pray this morning that you would take control of our hearts. We pray that you would take care of our hearts' desires. Lord, for money we already have or wish we had, relationships that we have lost that we would hope to start or for relationships we wish were better for physical attributes that 
we think we already have or which we have lost. Lord, we pray that uh, we would um, give up our respect, a desire for respect and admiration, that we would not overly value or wantonly pursue either. Lord, that you would take control of our desires for health, both health issues and health blessings. Lord, we pray we would leave them in your hands. And we pray, Lord, that we would set these things aside and desire you more than any of these ends. Lord, we also pray that you would take control of our heart's reactions, that we would not resist or oppose scripture, which convicts or challenges us. We pray, Lord, that we would not resist or oppose friends, family, church members who convict or challenge us. We pray that we would not resist anger, or we pray that we would not resist um, being social media posts and uh, the anger that it comes, Lord, but that we would conquer them and that we would respond in a loving way. Lord, we pray that we would also um, respond lovingly to opinions that uh, we would otherwise sinfully react to. Lord, that we would consider them through the truth of your word and the moving of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we also pray that we would not indulge or enjoy ungodly humor. And Lord, we pray that we would perf purify our hearts and our minds as we engage with others. Dear God, please take control of our minds. Take control of what we fill our minds with. Mindless scrolling on our phones and computers. Shopping for things we don't need or things we value too much. Seeking answers to questions. Could be scriptural or otherwise, but it's for the sake of pride. We pray we would do so in a humble way, Lord, to equip ourselves for work in your kingdom. And Lord, that you would keep us from being idle or weak-minded. And Lord, we also wish to uh, pray that you would take control of what our, mi our minds fill our lives with. Keep us from pride, selfish ambition, misplaced priorities, compromise, and serving and loving ourselves. Lord, in Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, you ask us and tell us to put off our old self, which belongs to our former manner of life, and our old self, which is corrupt through uh, deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of our minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Lord, we pray that you would go into the quiet places in our hearts and minds and direct them solely to the front of your throne, Lord, that you may speak there, reside there, conquer those areas, and Lord, clean and purify us from within. We thank you for your willingness to be there. We pray that we would meet with you, that we would dine with you. And Lord, we pray that you would take over areas that we are so unwilling to keep uh, to our, so unwilling to give up, and that we retain for ourselves, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Here at Westland Alliance Church, we do not take up tithes and offerings during the course of the service. Uh, there is a small box at the back of the sanctuary. It's on the right-hand side as you leave. If you brought those things with you today, you can deposit them there and they will be taken care of. Uh, if you need information on how to give digitally or online or electronically, you can find that information out from our office or from our church website. Uh, we continue to give thanks to God for his provision for our church through your faithful giving. I'm going to ask Alicia Hebert to come up for the public reading of God's word. Good morning. Scripture reading this morning is found in Psalm 85. To the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Selah. 
You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we continue on in our sermon series through the book of Psalms. So you are aware we are going to continue in the Psalms till the end of the month, uh, at, ch- at which time, as we usually do, I will do a uh, topical series for the month of October. That topic will be mission. And let me put a plug in for the members meeting tonight. Tonight, one of the things we're going to talk about is some of the mission of this church. Uh, I'm going to bring to your attention again our plans for global church planting and what that looks like going forward, as well as us hearing from John, and he's got some information about the youth and their uh, mission trip, which looks like it will be uh, brought uh, next year uh, for something for the uh, uh, senior highs to be able to do like we used to do at Mission Peru. So I encourage you to be there. But for today, we look at Psalm 85. My sermon is entitled, Restore Us, Revive Us. In Psalm 85, we hear the plea of the psalmist, restore us, revive us. These requests are so pronounced in how the psalm reads that they had to be the title of my sermon. I couldn't see it any other way. Now those words, especially the word revive, can get us thinking about the great Christian revivals of history. Perhaps when you hear that word, you think of the Welsh revival of 1904, which is said to have resulted in over 100,000 converts being added to the church. Or maybe you think of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and the First Great Awakening and its impact on the American colonies. Regardless of what comes to mind, the idea of revival is part of the imagination and the desires of Christians throughout the world. In 1959, British pastor and theologian Martin Lloyd-Jones preached 24 sermons to mark the centennial anniversary of the great transatlantic revival of 1859, sometimes called the Ulster Revival. Revival was something that he cared about deeply about. In one of those sermons, he lays out the stages of revival. The first stage of revival he calls realizing the need and confronting the sin. The second stage he calls mourning for sin. The third stage he gives the title urgent prayer and intercession. And the final stage he calls show me your glory when the fire falls. Now, I don't intend to preach on revival specifically this morning. I intend to preach the text. But we would do well as we start to note that the four stages of revival as laid out by Lloyd-Jones parallel Psalm 85 very closely. We see stage one as the psalmist realizes and recognizes the need of God's people. They are under the judgment of God. And that judgment is due to their sin, and they are confronting their sin in the psalm. And as the word lament indicates, they mourn for their sin, and they mourn for the results of that sin on their nation. And this corresponds with Lloyd-Jones' second stage. Now this psalm, like stage three, is also an urgent prayer of intercession for God's people and their difficulties. 
And finally, like stage four, they are asking for the glory and the grace of God to fall on their nation. So with those things in mind, let us take a look at this psalm. Take a look as God's people pray that he would restore them, that he would revive them. And let us consider how we might apply it today. Point number one, turning because of the past. God's grace in the past causes God's people to turn to them in their trouble. Now, since this psalm doesn't give us a specific time of composition, it's not revealed, many commentators guess at it, but we don't know, we can engage with it as just a general lament a general lament of God's people for healing, certainly spiritual healing and societal healing as well. In turning to God, the psalmist notes that in the past, God showed his people favor. And in the past, he did a work of restoration, moving them to a more prosperous condition. And as so often is the case, It is the recollection of the works of God in the past that eventually move the psalmist to prayer and then to praise. This past work of restoration was, it seems, primarily a spiritual restoration. Why do I say that? Well, the Lord in the past had graciously forgiven his people. The psalmist says, you forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin." Now, the words used here are interesting. The word translated forgave is a word that literally means to lift. God had lifted the iniquity of his people. And iniquity is a word for for talking about sin. And it refers to the bentness or the crookedness of humanity. And this spiritual crookedness considers sin as that which is premeditated, and that which is willful. It's a sin that is often regarded as an intensified type of evil. And that type of sinning, of course, incurs God's righteous wrath. It incurs his righteous and just judgment. Those who are guilty of iniquity, God directs his wrath and judgment to. And that guilt is the burden that God lifts. God's favor and restoration is also, we're told, the covering of their sin. And the covering of sin signifies God's pardon. Now, when we talk about God covering sin, you ought to think about that in terms of maybe a friend covering your bill at the restaurant. It's not suggesting that a veil is put over your bill. No, actually, your debt has been paid. What you owe has been removed. God took care of. He covered the sins of Israel. And their restoration is the result. And though the iniquity and sin of his people resulted in God's wrath and the ensuing judgment, the restoration of God's people through the lifting of the burden of guilt and the covering of their sins meant that God had been propitiated. We read, you withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Now remember, propitiation is the appeasing and removal of wrath through sacrifice. And this is part of the gracious restoration that God had done in the past. And so we see in the first three verses of this lament that as the psalmist turns to God, that a gospel framework actually emerges. We see in this a God who clearly desires to have relationship with humans, to have relationship with the people that he has created, to have relationship with the people who owe him their love and their worship. We also see people, people who have sinned, who have missed the mark of God's commands through their disobedience and who have willfully rejected God's ways and thus reject God himself. We also see the righteous wrath of God, the just judgment of God against sin and iniquity. 
and we see the graciousness of God. The graciousness of God who removes guilt, who covers the sin, whose wrath is removed. This is the pattern of the gospel. Now, we must note that the psalmist is lamenting because God's people have got themselves in the same situation that he had dealt with many years ago. They are in the same situation again. And that's why the psalmist recalls what God did back then, because he wants God to do that now in the present. Let us understand this morning that the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that this restoration of God's people has been accomplished once for all. Those who are God's people through faith in Jesus Christ never need to pray that God would once again save like he did in the time of Jesus. No, Jesus' work of forgiveness was once for all. It's occurred in the past. It never needs to happen again. The book of Hebrews says he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 9, 26. Believer, follower of Jesus, your Savior has accomplished already what the psalmist here laments for. Never forget that. And if you're here this morning and you're an unbeliever, understand that this is the good news that we believe and we build our lives on. The problem of our sin, which separates us from God and incurs His wrath and judgment, It has already been addressed in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Forgiveness and restoration and salvation, they're all available through faith in Christ. There is salvation in Jesus. There is forgiveness in Jesus. There is reconciliation with God through Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you're an unbeliever, I would encourage you to believe and trust in Him this morning. God is a gracious God. He has shown us His favor in Christ. And He showed His grace and His favor to His people in times long past. And because of that, the psalmist here turns to God as he laments. And as his lamenting continues... The psalmist moves from this turning to God to bring to God his complaints and to ask God in the present. Point number two, complaining and asking in the present. The current suffering of the people gives rise to godly complaints and confident requests. We've seen this several times this summer. We've learned this lament structure. Now, this lament structure is not as clean and tidy in Psalm 85 as it is in some of the other Psalms. We see in verses 4 through 7 the godly complaints which describe the situation the people of God are in, and we see their confident petitions that ask God for help. But in Psalm 85, they're a little mixed up. They're not divided so cleanly. I see the psalmist bringing his complaints to God in verses 5 and 6. With verses 4 and 7 be the, being the asking of God. 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6, we see the familiar rhetorical questions. And those are a way of the psalmist indicating their current situation, their current context, the reason for the lament. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? We can see what they're going through from these questions. The psalmist laments because God's people are under his wrath, presumably for their sinful waywardness. And this judgment has been going on for a considerable amount of time. The people are spiritually dead. They need reviving. They are sorrowful and they are weary and they desire to rejoice. And so they bring their complaints to God. And this is perhaps a good time to remind ourselves about godly complaining. Consider these words written by 
Mark Vrogop in the book on lament that I've re recommended multiple times called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. Quote, after we take the first step of turning to God in prayer, the next is bringing our complaints to Him. There is a tension here. I'm sure you already feel it. Complain isn't a very positive word. We don't like complainers. It seems like the wrong response to situations where we should be content or thankful. But is that always the case? Is complaining always wrong? It can't be. If you read the Psalms of Lament, you'll discover a lot of creative complaining. You'll find expressions of sorrow, fear, frustration, and even confusion. In other words, the Bible is full of complaints, and apparently they aren't all sinful. In fact, they were set to music as an entire congregation sang their frustration. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not giving you permission to vent self-centered rage at God when life has not turned out like you planned. I'm not suggesting for a second you have a right to be angry with God. I think that that is always wrong. But I do think that there is a place for a kind of complaining that is biblical, end quote. And I think he's right. And I think the Psalms of Lament teach us how to complain in a godly manner. The complaining that we see in the book of Psalms is, has several characteristics, and we must keep these in mind as we bring our complaints to God. First, complaining in biblical lament is done with humility. Again, the author Mark Vrogop notes, Proud, demanding questions from a heart that believes it is owed something from God will never lean into true lament. Before you start complaining, be sure you've checked arrogance at the door. Come with your pain, not your pride. And that's why I think the complaints in the form of questions are helpful. The questions indicate that we don't have all the answers. We cannot see the end from the beginning. And so we can come humbly. Secondly, godly complaints are rooted in faith. They're rooted in faith in a God who hears us, faith in a God who cares for us, faith in a God who is powerful enough and wise enough to deal with our hurt and our pain and our suffering and our frustrations. And so we bring our complaints in faith. Thirdly, godly complaints are truthful. We need to learn to be honest with God when we pray. He is our loving Father. We can go to Him with those things that we suffer from and are hurt from. We should be honest with Him. We can bring our complaints to God, as the Psalms of Lament indicate. But as we do so, let's do so humbly truthfully, and with faith. And let us remember as we bring those complaints to God that this is part of a process, part of a process that moves us from bringing our complaints to God to asking for his help. That's what we see in the Psalms. Psalm 85 is asking God for help. We see this in verses 4 and 7. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Now that first request is in the form of an effect and a cause. What is the effect? The people would be restored to him. What is the cause of that restoration? God removes his indignation, removes his anger. And we see that this request is brought with confidence and with trust. The psalmist addresses God as the God of our salvation. In Psalm 3, the psalmist cries out, O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Well, how does the psalmist reply in Psalm 3, verse 3 and 4? You, O Lord, are a shield about me, 
my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. It is to a God that saves that the psalmist makes requests. Show us your steadfast love is another request, and it's a very specific appeal. The steadfast love of the Lord refers to his covenantal loyal love. It is an appeal to God to fulfill his covenant promises. And they're asking God to be gracious. They know that they cannot ask for justice, so they appeal to his mercy and kindness and love. Restore us, remove our sin, revive us, love us, save us. These are the petitions of lament. Commentator Alan P. Ross sums it up nicely. Whatever their actual circumstances, they are praying for an end to the darkness of divine displeasure through a great deliverance from their prolonged suffering. And so the psalmist has turned to God because of the past. The psalmist has made godly complaints And the psalmist has made confident requests in the present. And so what does our framework for lament teach us that we should expect? At the end of this psalm, we should expect trusting in God. And this psalm does it, and it does it with a flourish. Point number three, trusting for the future. The psalmist, through this process of lament, arrives at a place where he hopefully expects restoration, where he hopefully expects revival as God's people's lives have been reoriented towards him. What does the psalmist trust God for in these closing verses of Psalm 85? Well, he trusts that the Lord will speak peace. Now, that's an interesting phrase, speak peace. Not that he will perform peace, not that he will cause peace, but that he will speak peace. The NIV application commentary notes that it is the ordinary word for speaking that is used. But of course, the concept is far from ordinary. For speech is the means by which God accomplishes that which he accomplishes. The speech of God is a creative act. It brings things into being. It transforms reality. The voice of God creates a new reality. From nothing, God's speech brings order and beauty beyond imagination. It is this same creative speech that declares a new spiritual reality into the being, into being for the people of God. And so the psalmist trusts God to speak peace. The psalmist also trusts God that salvation is near. Though they have suffered, though they have been mired in sin, though his wrath has been heavy upon them, salvation is near to those who fear God. Salvation is near to those who look to God in reverence. Salvation is near to those who repent before God in humility. And salvation is near to those who obey God with diligence. Now the next verses, the next verse, verse 10, is beautiful. It grabs our attention. It's heartwarming and perhaps in some ways a startling image. We read, steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss together or sorry, kiss each other. It was interesting to read that verse in some other translations. The New American Standard Bible says, graciousness and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The King James Version says, mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The Christian Standard Bible says, faithful love and truth will join together. Righteousness and peace will embrace. What's the meaning of these verses? I think that they describe both a tension for humanity and at the same time, they describe the gracious and all-encompassing attributes of God to save. Here's what I mean. There is a tension 
for humanity. There is a tension for God's people in these four characteristics, in these four attributes, steadfast love, faithfulness, righteousness, and peace. Those four words represent the benefits of a covenant with God as well as the expectations or obligations of a covenant with God. God has promised his people steadfast love and peace, and he expects from his people their faithfulness and their righteousness. God's covenant with Israel is where these things meet. It's where they embrace. It's where they kiss. But the tension that's there, for those of you who are tracking, is that we understand we utterly fail at our obligations. We far too often show faithlessness in our lives instead of faithfulness. We pursue idols of comfort and power and fame and wealth and health and so many other worldly pursuits. And we pursue them at the expense of our relationship with and at the expense of our faithfulness to God. And so we're not in so many ways faithful. We're also not righteous. We far too often walk in unrighteousness. We walk in Ways like are laid out in Mark 7, 21 through 23. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. And so there's a tension here. We see this beautiful image of God, a God of steadfast love, a God who brings peace. But we know We don't always walk in faithfulness. We don't always walk in righteousness. We've been given this steadfast love. We've been given this peace, and we respond with unfaithfulness and unrighteousness. So there's a tension there. And yet, as I said, these verses also describe the gracious, all-encompassing attributes of God to save his people. You see, In God the Son, all four of these attributes come together in a glorious picture of a loving, peace-giving Savior who saved us through his own faithfulness and his own righteousness. Let's take a look at that for a moment this morning. Consider the Savior's love for us. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of his love, leading onward, leading homeward to thy glorious rest above. The love of Jesus for God's people is attested to in our hymns. And more importantly than that, it's attested to in Scripture. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Galatians 2, 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus also gives peace to God's people. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see those marvelous attributes in the Son of God, but what astounds us, what astounds us about the new covenant is that God also fulfills our obligations. Through Jesus, God becomes our faithful representative. He becomes our righteous surrogate. We are unfaithful, we are unrighteous, and yet he was faithful. And he was righteous as our representative. 
In the book of Revelation, Jesus is called the faithful witness and the faithful and true witness. 1 verse 5, 3 verse 14. He's also described in Revelation 19, 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Canadian theologians and professors Peter Gentry and Stephen Wellham write in their book, Kingdom Through Covenant, these words. Throughout the entire canon, God's promises are rooted in his sovereign initiative to save. For without his unilaterally acting, we as the entire human race are without hope. God must act and God alone. But ultimately, that action requires the provision of a faithful son through whom all God's promises are brought to pass. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was the faithful son the faithful son on our behalf. And Jesus was also the righteous son. In John, 1 John 2, 1, the apostle John calls God the son, Jesus Christ the righteous. And the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 writes, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Christ, we become the righteousness of God because Jesus is righteous and he was righteous for us. Brothers and sisters, it is our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ, and the new covenant wrought by God that sees steadfast love and faithfulness meet. It is in the beautiful and only begotten Son of God that righteousness and peace kiss each other. Jesus is steadfast in his love. Jesus gives us peace. Christ was faithful and righteous on our behalf. And so even as we perceive the psalmist trusting God in the words, yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase, we also declare our trust in God by saying the Lord has given us what is good. He has given us his son. And the son will increase until all creation is restored in him. And so how should we respond to this glorious good news of a loving, faithful, righteous, and peace-giving Savior? How do we respond? Well, let's go back to that tension, that tension that we felt in those verses. Because even as the people of God in the Old Covenant were called to be faithful in worshiping God and called to be righteous in their obedience to God, we of the New Covenant are called to the same things. We're called to be faithful. We're called to be righteous. However, because of Jesus Christ, we do not pursue faithfulness and righteousness for our salvation but from our salvation. Let me say that again. Because of Jesus Christ, we do not pursue faithfulness and righteousness for our salvation, but from our salvation. It's because we are saved that we pursue those things, not so that we will be saved. It's because of the steadfast love of Jesus that we can be righteous, that we can be obedient. John 15, 9 and 10 says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And Paul said of himself in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, that this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. And I believe we should say those same words. We should be found faithful. And thankfully, Paul also reminds us that faithfulness is a gift of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. So brothers and sisters, we are called to pursue faithfulness. And we are called to pursue righteousness, not for our salvation, but from our salvation. And we are to do so in the power of the Spirit and by the grace of Christ. And when we fail, when we instead pursue other things, things like we read about in Galatians 5, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivals, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. When we pursue these things, we repent. And we confess our sins. And we receive the forgiveness that Christ won for us on the cross. And even as the psalmist lamented for God to restore and revive his people when their sin had debilitated and degraded their worship of God, so we look to God to forgive us and to restore us and to revive us and to love us. But we do so in and through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Psalms, and we thank you for Psalm 85. Father God, I would think on each of your people's hearts this morning would be the desire that you would restore them and revive them. And Father God, I, I pray that you would help all of us to understand that the work of salvation, the work of forgiveness, the work of restoration that Christ did was once for all. We don't need to pray for it to happen again. But Father God, we do need to pray, Lord, that you would help us, that you would help us to lean into Christ and all that he's done that we would confess our sins and receive that forgiveness and through the power of the Spirit pursue faithfulness and righteousness. And Father God, I pray that you would remind us this week and remind unbelievers this week the tension that we feel in this psalm, the tension that our sin creates, the tension because you love us and you want to give us peace, but we sin and we're unfaithful in unrighteousness. And help both believer and unbeliever in regards to that this week, help us to call out to Christ that we might find restoration, that we might find revival in him. We pray this in his name, amen. We're going to close our service by turning our eyes and our affection and our attention onto our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. So please stand as you're able and sing with us. Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn
responsive. Your response will be up on the screen. The Lord forgives the iniquity of his people. The Lord covers the sin of his people. He is the God of our salvation. Praise God from... 